So greetings and hello, everyone. I hope uh, this works and that all of you can hear me. Uh, I'd, I'd like to apologize for the delay and the background noise. That's a sort of peculiarly American phenomenon of using very, very loud lawnmowers and other machines, which suddenly started just as I was about to start this video. But anyway, um, uh, greetings, everyone. I am Supriya Gandhi. I teach at Yale University, and I'm also the author of a book on Dara Shukul, uh, called The Emperor Who Never Was, Dara Shukul in Mughal India. And Dara Shukul is the subject of my talk today. And at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Ishan and the team at Karwan India for having this really wonderful series of lectures uh, during this difficult time. Now, Dara Shukho is probably the most famous Mughal prince who didn't become emperor. Of course, you know, we all know about the Mughal princes who went on to become rulers. But of those who never really managed to sit on the throne, Dara Shuko is the most famous. He's well known for his role in the battle for succession after Shah Jahan fell ill between <clears throat> Dara Shuko and his younger brothers, Shuja, um, Aurangzeb and Murad. Dara Shukur is also well known for his intellectual and his spiritual activities. And I'm just going to show you a quote that encapsulates a common view that people hold about Dara Shukur, uh, whether in the public imagination uh, or whether uh, in the scholarly imagination. This is a quite a common view that Dara Shukur was a mystic. He, uh, he had his head, uh, his head in the clouds all the time. He was bent on pursuing his spiritual activities, but he wasn't really cut out to be a ruler. Uh, and so the distinguished historian R.C. Majundar says in his foreword to um, uh, Kanungo's very scholarly uh, and erudite book on Dara Shuko, had his pursuits been less intellectual and aims less spiritual, he might have been more successful in his enterprise. So here there's this image of Dara Shuko as somebody who doesn't really have the desire or the aim uh, to be a ruler, that his activities actually uh, operated in distinction to those that other Mughal princes practiced. Now, what I'd like to do in this talk is to show you how Dara Shuko's intellectual and spiritual activities were not unconnected with Mughal sovereignty. They were not disconnected from his own self-fashioning as a future ruler. In fact, they were very closely integrated with how he cultivated himself as a future ruler. So Dara Shukur was not so much a misfit in the Mughal court. He actually drew on a range of ideas of Mughal sovereignty that he then refashioned and molded uh, in his own way. So during the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on Dara Shukur's relationship with the Qadiri Sufi order and uh, his Sufi writings, uh, as well as the activities of the imperial family. And I'm also going to focus on his engagement with Indic thought. For instance, his translations of various Sanskrit works. Uh, and then after this uh, slideshow, uh, I will then have another live video where I will be able to engage in conversation with you and answer questions. Now, a key turning point in Dara Shuko's life was when he moved from being the eldest son of a disgraced rebel prince who really um, fought a hard-won struggle against his father to eventually become the ruler, that is, uh, Shah, his father, Shah Jahan, um, to being 
the emperor's favored heir. Uh, so this is an illustration by Pichitra in the uh, Windsor Pacha Nama uh, that was made a couple of years after his father uh, acceded to the throne. And here you have Dara Shuku being um, paying his respects to his father and being embraced by him with his brothers and Asif Khan uh, standing in the background. Uh, so this, uh, this image here is really emblematic of Dara Shuku's very favored status in Shah Jahan's court. Now, as a young prince, Dara Shuku did the sorts of things that princes normally did. Every prince, of course, was a ruler in the making. And Dara Shuku, perhaps more than his brothers, had access to a whole range of resources, including his father's workshops, artists, um, uh, key works of art, uh, and he also cultivated calligraphy. So one of the things that he did when uh, when he was a young prince, uh, you know, possibly in uh, in in Burhanpur or where the imperial family uh, lived for uh, for a while, shortly after Shah Jahan's accession, was to assemble uh, a lustrous album, a murakka, which still exists, more or less intact. Uh, it's now held at the British Library, and this is just an excerpt uh, from. The introduction that he wrote to the album, which was actually uh, kept separately from it, you know, I've crowned the pen with writing spear and conquered the realm of calligraphy. It's an introduction that has a lot of hubris, a lot of self-confidence. That was kind of the part, partly what was expected in the genre. But you also see here a young prince who is really out to conquer the world, the world of letters in this case. Um, uh, the world of art as well. What you have here is an example of calligraphy that is attributed to Dara Shuko. There are many museums uh, that uh, hold such examples. Not all of them would have necessarily been produced by the prince himself. But in this sample of calligraphy, what's significant here is uh, the choice of a topic. This is um, a, a text that is attributed uh, to the great philosopher Aristotle, uh, the Dehpande uh, Arastu. So this is advice uh, that is uh, given by Aristotle. And Aristotle is significant uh, for the Mughals uh, and in Islamic thought because he was the tutor of Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander the Great, the Macedonian uh, ruler had, um, had a very different image in Persian literature because he was not only somebody who set out to be the world ruler, he was also a model for kingship uh, and in this case a model for Mughal kingship because he was not only the conqueror of the material world, he also cultivated himself spiritually. So in this image here, which is from a manuscript that Dara would have access to, would have had access to in the Imperial Library, we have Iskandar, as he was known in Persian literature, in the likeness of the Emperor Akbar. So here we have you know, the Emperor Akbar who is often painted into these illustrated manuscripts of texts that are about kingship and other things. And here he's visiting a hermit. So it's a it's a kind of it's a typical scene where Iskandar uh, meets re religious figures, he meets sages in the forest, or he holds a council with a group of philosophers and sages. So here he is, the enlightened ruler, who is elevating himself spiritually and intellectually by his dialogue with these philosophers and holy men. And here we have Akbar who is putting himself into that model. There are ways in which Jahangir also has portraits and images painted of him that resonate with this motif of Alexander as the enlightened philosopher king. So Dar Shuko had a lot of models for kingship uh, that embraced these 
particular motifs and themes. I'm going to move now to Dara Shoko's relationship with the Qadari Sufi order. Uh, now, an often forgotten fact is that it was actually Shah Jahan who introduced Dara Shoko to the Qadari order. Uh, as the story goes, as Dara Shoko recounts it, the prince, that is Dara Shoko, was terribly ill. He was unwell and there was nobody who could really find a cure for him. So Shah Jahan, they were in Lahore at this point, Shah Jahan took him to meet the Qadari Sufi Miamir. And this is an illustration from a, uh, of a manuscript uh, from a, te a text that Dara Shukur wrote uh, later that depicts this encounter. So the emperor takes his son to meet the Sufi. And soon after that, Dara Shuko is completely cured in his own account. And this incident spurs him to continue his association with the Qadari order. Now, it wasn't unusual for Mughals and Sufis to have a kind of symbiotic relationship, for Mughals to um, cultivate an association with various Sufi orders. But with Dara Shuko, he went a little further. He was not only the enlightened ruler who edified himself um, through conversations with Sufis, he was actually somebody who cultivated his own spiritual abilities in a way that surpassed those of other rulers. And in Dara Shuko's own writings, he doesn't even hesitate to show his father in a slightly worse light. So there's one anecdote where he says that Shah Jahan is having this conversation with Mia Mir and he says, well, you know, I'm not like so happy with the world. And Mia Mir replies and says, and he quotes this famous line from Rumi, Ham Khuda Mi Khai Ham Dunya Yidun In Khyalas to Mohalas to Junoon. So you want, you want God as well as the material world. This is mere fancy. This is impossible. This is madness. And what Dara Shuko is trying to convey is that he actually has chanced upon a path to, to, re, to truly encompass both. And this is a theme that we will see uh, in a bit with his other writings. Uh, so this poem actually is uh, interestingly uh, put uh, alongside this uh, later image of uh, Miamir and his own disciple and successor, Mullah Shah. Now, the sources for the imperial family's relationship with the Qadri order um, are many. We have Dara Shuko's own writings, his first book, the Safina Tololia, which is a collection of Sufi biographies, uh, his second work, the Sakina Tololia, which incorporates his own spiritual biography and uh, details on uh, his own branch of the Qadri order. And then we have writings by his sister. And that's something that I will come to uh, in more detail in a bit, because Dara Shuko's own literary activities were actually carried out in tandem with those of Jahanara, his, his elder sister. So she wrote a biography of Chishti saints called the Munasul Arva, and she also wrote her own spiritual bio, um, autobiography, the Risale Sahibia. And then we have an unofficial chronicle of Mullah Shah's relationship with the imperial family by Tabakkul Beg, uh, who was a Qadari disciple, which is entitled the Nuskhaya ehwal -e shahi So this is not a court chronicle. This is not produced uh, in order to glorify the emperor. And it's also not the kind of typical Sufi polemical treatise that one might have that elevates the Sufi and you know shows how he is spiritually far superior to, uh, to rulers and to those who wield worldly power. 
uh, it's a very interesting text that tells fills in a lot of gaps uh, that the official chronicles, the imperial chronicles, don't have, and that Dara Shuko and Jahanara's writings also don't have. Uh, and it, it chronicles the shifts in the relationship between the imperial family and the Qadiri order of Miamir and Mullah Shah. So we'll see some more details on that in a bit. So I just wanted to move to Dara Shuko's initial project, his uh, compilation of Sufi biographies. And this he wrote as he was becoming closer to this Qadiri uh, order. Uh, we're fortunate that uh, a copy with his own annotations has survived. It's in the Khudabaksh library. And he completed this on the 27th of Ramzan, 1049. The 27th of Ramzan, which is often associated with the Laylatul Qadr, the night you know, when the Quran descended in its entirety uh, to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, and it's considered a very auspicious day. Uh, this was a day that Dara Shuko liked to, to use uh, for its um, auspiciousness uh, for the completion of his books. And interestingly, this is also the day when his sister, Jahanara Begum, also completed her Monas al Arva, which is again, also a compilation of Sufi biographies. Uh, and we, uh, we can actually glean some details from her autobiography that the two siblings, uh, as they traveled, because uh, the Mughals were always peripatetic uh, and the two siblings almost never left their father, uh, that they were exchanging books uh, and ideas and discussing uh, and uh, you know, uh, sometimes meeting in person as they carried out these first spiritual and literary projects of their own. So Dara Shuko's own project can't be seen as separate from what his sister was doing and also from his father's own spiritual and uh, uh, imperial activities. We also have from, uh, from this period, uh, from, from the 17th century, from Shah Jahan's reign, a whole host of paintings that were produced clearly for the imperial family of their Qadari uh, spiritual preceptors, uh, paintings of Miamir and paintings of Mullah Shah. Sometimes these are paintings you know, with both Miamir and Mullah Shah sitting together. Sometimes there are paintings of them uh, you know, occasionally with Dara Shuko al uh, alongside them. And sometimes there are individual portraits uh, of these figures, especially of Mullah Shah. And Jahanara gives us a hint in her spiritual autobiography of how these paintings were used. Uh, they were used for spiritual purposes you know, uh, by gazing upon them uh, if one was at a physical distance from the spiritual preceptor. And Jahanara, being a woman, uh, did not have face-to-face -face contact with Mullah Shah. She interacted with him through letters, through gazing on portraits that her um, brother had commissioned for her, uh, as well as through looking at him from afar. There was this one incident where she wants to see him in person, and as she is leaving, uh, she, she stops her elephant, and Mullah Shah dismounts from his horse and sits under a mulberry tree, and she sees him and you know, is from a distance and is completely dazzled. So the spiritual activities of these imperial siblings and their father, who also had many, many encounters uh, and uh, conversations uh, with, the, with these Qadri Sufis, so all happened together. It wasn't something that Dara Shukru was doing entirely on his own. Now, during this time, as Shah Jahan's two eldest children were carrying out their own literary projects, writing about Sufis, Shah Jahan too was engaged in his own self-cultivation. Uh, for instance, you know, he was modeling himself on his ancestor Timur. Uh, there was an autobiography, a, a probably spurious one, that reached the court, uh, which uh, Shah Jahan also, you know, uh, 
uh, read and recommended and popularized a bit. Uh, he changed the calendar from the solar Elahi calendar that uh, Akbar had put in place to the lunar Hijri calendar. And he also keeps changing his uh, chroniclers. He, he, uh, he doesn't need to write the chronicles uh, of his own court, but he gets various other imperial historians to write these chronicle, chronicles. So he dismisses uh, an earlier chronicler, Kuzvini, and replaces him with Lahori uh, uh, at this point. Uh, and our argument is that these literary uh, projects uh, shouldn't, uh, should not be seen in distinction to or in separation from the literary projects that Shah Jahan's own two children were engaging in. As time passed, Dara Shoko became more and more convinced that he had been granted special qualities that other emperors or rulers in the past had not received. So in his second work, um, uh, on uh, Qadri Sufis. Uh, he actually declares at the beginning, on a Thursday of my 25th year, I was asleep when a hidden voice called out and repeated four times, that which had not been possible for any emperor on earth, God the Most High has given to you. Uh, and his introduction to this work uh, actually seeks to demonstrate this, that it is possible to advance spiritually and also operate in the material world with material power uh, and success. During this time, we have an insight from Tawakkul Beg's Nuskai Ehwale Shahi, this unofficial chronicle, that there was a fusion taking place between the imperial household and between the household of Mullah Shah. Mia Mir had now passed away, Mullah Shah was his successor, uh, he was from originally from Badakhshan. He lived in Kashmir. And initially, Mullah Shah was very aloof. Even though Mia Mir had, uh, you know, had met and had uh, encountered the imperial family, Mullah Shah turned Dara Shuko away. He said he had no interest in uh, interacting with you know, emperors and rulers. Uh, he was not interested. But as time went by, and as the imperial family cultivated him, the relationship started to change. And we have some really unprecedented uh, instances here of Mullah Shah's own disciples becoming imperial servants and imperial servants, uh, a whole range of them, who are joining Mullah Shah's order. So there is this actual interpenetration of infusion of these two households. And as time went by, the formerly aloof Qadari Sufi came to enjoy the patronage of the imperial family and came to slowly be incorporated into the imperial family's household as well. So for instance, Dara Shako built for Mullah Shah, the Pari Mahal, uh, this famous location that still exists, uh, albeit in ruins in Srinagar, um, which according to Tawakul Beg was an extraordinary heart enchanting, sort of pleasure granting place. And Jahanara, uh, with the help of her father, so built a mosque for Mullah Shah in Srinagar, um, along with a hammam, a bathhouse, and a khanaka. Uh, you know, and, and as Tawakul Beg reports, uh, he tells Jahanara's agent, uh, who is stationed in Kashmir, to tell his mistress to make a Hanukkah for God. So, so the formerly aloof Sufi is now asking for what he needs from the imperial family. And he's also repaying the imperial family in kind with lavish poetry of praise. Uh, this is just an excerpt. Uh, from Mullah Shah's very, very extensive poems, O oh, Thou Shah Jaha and Thou Dara, and Thou Dara and um, Thou uh, Jahanara, to you the eternal rulership of the world, uh, 
uh, and there's a play here on uh, with Shah Jahan, meaning world ruler over here, to use sovereignty of the world forever. Uh, so this is this is from uh, an illuminated manuscript that exists in the British Library, where we have Mullah Shah's own annotations and corrections, um, which was completed in 1648 and gifted to the imperial family. And by this time, Mullah Shah would escape the harsh winters of Kashmir to go and stay with the imperial family in Lahore. Uh, so he was truly incorporated into the imperial family, uh, uh, becoming part of their household and often conversing with Shah Jahan and giving him advice on various issues. Um, I'm now going to move on to Dara Shuku's engagement with Indic religions. So all the while, his Dara Shuku's father and his sister were quite deeply involved with Qadri Sufis. Dara Shuku branched out quite a bit. Now, a lot of this was his just his own intellectual trajectory. He was extremely curious um, uh, and very wide ranging in what he read. Uh, he had had uh, not only dialogues with other Sufis apart from his own Qadri masters, but um, with Hindu religious figures such as Baba Lal, uh, in 1653. But there was this period of time in the mid 1650s when Dara Shuku engaged very intensely with Indic thought. And this period of time also overlapped with his own activities when he was making overtures to various Rajput rulers. Uh, so this, this is an image from uh, the Bachanama, Nama, where we see Shah Jahan and Dara Shuko being received uh, by Khizr, uh, kind of this prophet-like figure, outside Ajmer in, in 1654. And this coincides with a visit that the two made uh, in order to quell Rana Raj Singh um, of Mewar, who was building fortifications that were uh, seen as a threat. So during this period, Dara Shuko is trying to conciliate and consolidate his relationship with Rajput rulers. And we have several examples of this. Uh, in 1653 to 4, that he has sent princely decrees pra praising Rana Jai Singh. Um, uh, in 1654, he actually has his own son, Suleiman Shuko, wed the daughter of Amar Singh, who is um, Jai Singh's nephew. In 1654, also, Dara Shuko's envoy, Chandarpan Brahman, who is part of Dara Shuko's household, mediates between the emperor and the recalcitrant Rana Raj Singh. And we have Aurangzeb who's also trying to compete with this. Aurangzeb, for instance, is sending gifts to Jai Singh along with his envoy, also a Hindu envoy, Indar Bhatt with a diamond ring to independently forge ties with Rana Raj Singh. So we have competition here between the brothers um, who are trying to woo these Rajput rulers because they do see what is looming in the horizon. They see a struggle for succession looming in the horizon. But for Dharma Shuko, uh, his, his interest in Indic thought should be seen with this in the background, but it would be simplistic to say that he was kind of merely carrying out these activities in order to impress uh, these Rajput rulers. Um, nevertheless, you know, he starts out in as early as 1646 in his Risale Haknoma, which is uh, like a, a, uh, um, a treatise for li uh, liberation written uh, in the style of uh, other similar Sufi treatises. But there are some little seeds here that he's acquainted with certain yogic concepts and with the idea of the Trimurti. By the time in 1653, he has dialogues with Baba Lal in Lahore, uh, he 
shows that he's very well acquainted with various Indic texts, like the Ramayana, for instance, uh, and with various uh, concepts in Indic thought. Uh, these dialogues were then memorialized uh, as a text in written form uh, in Persian in, vari in varying recensions. So there are different formats of it. You know, they're not necessarily the exact dialogues that, that Dara Shuko had. In 1655, uh, Dara Shuko writes the Majmal Bahrain, the meeting place of two oceans, which is a comparative sort of work that makes equivalences between various Indic concepts. Uh, some of these are Vedantic concepts. We also get the sense that he's read various um, uh, Vaishnava texts, you know, like the Bhagavad Purana, for, for instance. Uh, and he equates these with various Sufi concepts. Uh, and during this time, he is also engaged in uh, commissioning translations of numerous Indic texts, possibly the Bhagavad Gita, uh, definitely the Yoga Vasishta. There are different um, versions of this. Uh, there is a, a Persian Yoga Vasishta translation um, where uh, Ram in dialogue um, uh, with his uh, Guru Vasisht uh, is led to a kind of Jivan Mukti, living liberation uh, in this world. Uh, and then there is a, an even more abridged form of the, of the Yoga Vasishta uh, that was translated into Hindavi, uh, known as the Jnana Sara, uh, which was composed by Kavindra Charya. Kavindra Charya was a Brahmin Pandit uh, and famous intellectual from Banaras, uh, who in the 1650s enjoyed a lot of patronage at Shah Jahan's court and was very frequently rewarded by the emperor. Now, all of these activities culminated in the Sirri Akbar, which is a translation of about 50 plus Upanishads, um, or some works that are treated as Upanishads, uh, that was completed in August 1657. And it is in this work that Dara Shuko finally believes that he has found the font of monotheism. Uh, before I show you uh, just a little extract from its preface, this is an image uh, that was also painted. So we see uh, Dara Shuko's um, engagement with Indic religions uh, in visual form in this image that was painted probably in the 1650s during this this period of time when Dara Shuko was doing the kinds of things that a sort of pragmatic ruler does with his political activities, um, as well as cultivating his own inner self. Uh, so at the, the top band of this painting portrays uh, numerous uh, well-known Sufis um, and founders of canonical Sufi orders. And then the middle band portrays Sufis who are in different states of ecstasy. These are not you know, the sober Sufis. These, they are, they are uh, engaging in sama and sort of musical audition and swooning in ecstasy. And right at the bottom, uh, we have a whole array of various sons, uh, including Kabir. You see him with a peacock feather in his cap um, on the left-hand side and yogis. There's Matsyendranath, uh, Goraknath, there's Chidrup, um, uh, the Hindu ascetic who had had dialogues with um, Akbar and Jahangir, and, uh, and Baba Lal is also included over here. So this really, you know, whether or not Dara Shuko meant it this way, represents the various stages in Dara Shuko's own spiritual and intellectual trajectory, where he uh, he, he wrote about various Sufis and Sufi orders. He moved to documenting the ecstatic utterances of Sufis um, in his risale i Haknuma. And then he actually uh, moved to a deeper engagement with Indic thought, teasing out in particular its monotheistic strands um, uh, that, that he was you know, most uh, closely interested in. So to go back to the Siri Akbar, um, uh, Dara Shuko, uh, in his introduction, talks about his spiritual trajectory uh, in a sort of formulaic way that you know he's he 
he was really searching for this font of pure monotheism. He didn't find it in uh, Jewish and Christian religious scriptures, but he didn't find it in various other places. He found that the Quran itself was was very difficult and um, uh, allegorical, and he, you know, needed some other external source in order to help understand it. And then he actually found it in the Upanishads. Uh, so this is a quote from uh, his introduction. Uh, it becomes clearly manifest that this verse, uh, this is a verse in the Quran, is literally applicable to this ancient book. The ancient book, meaning the Upanishads, that this indeed is a noble Quran in a book kept hid hidden, Kitab Maknun, which none touches save the purified, a revelation from the Lord of the worlds. So this is a verse that has been interpreted you know, in, in various ways uh, by um, traditional commentators of the Quran, but Dara Shuko has his own unique interpretation of it. Since the Upnikhat, that is the Upanishads, which is a concealed secret, is the origin of this book, and the verses of the glorious Quran are found in it literally, in this hidden book is the ancient book through which the unknown has become known and the incomprehensible comprehensible to this fakir. So Dara Shuko is declaring that the verses of the Quran are actually contained in the Upanishads. And in this pure font of monotheism, that is the Upanishads, the Quran can actually become more comprehensible. So this, so this is a form of exegesis of the Quran. Now, by, by mastering this wisdom, Darushuku has arrived uh, at a special spiritual plane. He no longer needs teachers necessarily, if he has actually found the source of God's oneness in, in the Upanishads. So uh, this, uh, this marks an important stage in his own self-fashioning as a philosopher ruler. And almost just as Darashuko reached this own stage in his intellectual and spiritual development, while he was co-governing the empire with his father from Shah Jahanabad, but his father falls terribly ill. His brothers make various claims to the throne and the kingdom is now plunged in a struggle for succession to the throne, which of course overturns everything. So I, I'm happy now to move to the question and answer session where um, I can discuss in more detail the war of succession, you know, was it a religious war, what, was it not, and any other questions that you might have on Dara Shuko and his political and spiritual enterprise. Thank you, and bear with me for two minutes while I move to the live video. <laughs> 